we're live streaming on Facebook. We want to welcome to What's Next Virginia slash Virginia Free TV, our good friend, Dr. Bob Holsworth, who's going to update us on what's going on in COVID here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Bob, can you give us an overview and then let's do some diving into the numbers that you've been closely watching. And I want, hey, I want to thank you for doing that. It's a great public service you're offering. Yeah, I, you know, it's been very interesting, Chris, because, um, you know, our numbers had been, you know, had, had been relatively high about a month, a month and a half ago, and then they were sort of reduced. And when they were high, they were being driven, um, particularly by Northern Virginia, what I call the core Nova communities. Uh, in a number of instances, most days they were over 50% of the confirmed cases. In some days they were 60, 70% of the confirmed cases. Wow. So what's happened in the last couple of weeks has been pretty fascinating because Nova, the, the, no, the core Nova communities have really um, driven down the rate of infection tremendously. Um, they're getting maybe one quarter to one to 20% of the infections per day that they were getting three or four weeks ago. But at the same time, the state's numbers have gone, bounced back up, not quite to where they were, but they've gone to, you know, approximately eight to 800 to 1,000 a day in terms of confirmed infections. And what, what's happened is that the composition has changed. Um, for many weeks, Hampton Roads had almost no infections in the core Hampton Roads communities. Right. And I'm considering the ones in the peninsula and on the beach side. Right, right, right. They were getting 25, 40 infections a day for the for the first part of the pandemic. And now what we're seeing is they're up between four and 500 infections a day uh, there. So uh, it, it's been really interesting on that front. And then secondly, uh, the virus has now kind of extended its tentacles uh, throughout the state to some of the less populated areas. So we're seeing places like Danville, uh, the ice detention facility in Farmville, uh, Galax a couple of weeks ago had a big run. Um, and so what we've now seen is the numbers overall are slightly down from their high, but the composition has changed dramatically. A lot more cases in, North, um, in Hampton Roads, far fewer cases in Nova, and then uh, we're seeing some rural communities um, uh, it, dealing with the virus far more significantly than they may have up to now. So if, if I can, I think the obvious question here or observation is going to have to be, is it because the beaches are open in Virginia Beach and, and the Hampton Roads, or is it deeper in throughout all of Hampton Roads? And are there correlations to the protests that went on in eastern and southeastern Virginia? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just can't tell for sure because the numbers don't, don't help to explain that. And we have arguments about that. Some people are arguing about the reopening. Some people are talking about the protests. Um, you know, we've seen it uh, in terms of Hampton Roads, uh, Newport News and Norfolk have had uh, extensive numbers go up, but so has Chesapeake and Virginia Beach, um, you know, on, on, you know, far more closer to the beach. So uh, by and large, I don't know exactly if those two, are, if that's the reason, one of those two features, or, you know, I, I sometimes think that uh, in some ways the, um, the virus hadn't even really hit Hampton Roads their numbers were so low by comparison, not only to Nova, but to the RVA area, is that it was almost as if they had been um, almost quasi immune. And now all of a sudden the virus has gone down there and it's starting to hit um, in ways that we saw in Richmond and particularly in Nova um, two and three months ago. And I don't exactly know the reason, I wish I could, we could tell you, um, but, but obviously, uh, we have a different situation today than we had um, as as recently as two to three weeks ago. That's that's very interesting because a lot of things happened in the month of June in this country. You know, obviously schools were already off, but you had the beaches opening up, you had the protests, you had people moving around a bit more freely, thinking this thing was put away. Um, and I think a lot of people took comfort in the fact that our our treatments of COVID were getting better. People weren't dying as often. They weren't as hospitalized as, as much. Uh, where are we now in Virginia on hospitalization rates and more, most importantly, dying? I mean, yeah. how deadly is yeah. this in Virginia? The hospitalizations are, are interesting that, um, you know, the best, the best uh, data for hospitalizations come from the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association. And, and they started uh, a dashboard in April 8th. 
um, I think about that time, we probably had about eight or 900 people in hospitals with COVID-19. It went up to a high of, I think, Chris, 1625. Then it went down uh, very considerably. It was going down, went down to like 750 with our uh, test positivity rate that had been as high as 15, went down to 5.8%. And over the last week and a half, the number of people in hospitals have actually gone up. And those hospitals, um, we now have, I think today was about 1,130. So sort of a midway between the low point and the high point in terms of the people in hospital uh, in hospitals. In terms of the death rate, and, and, and that, that's been, um, that's a challenge because that's often a lagging indicator. People are in the hospitals for weeks beforehand. Um, but we've had a pretty, con pretty consistently, um, you know, people keep dying. I think today we finally passed 2,000 people, unfortunately, um, who are now died in Virginia, dead in Virginia from what people believe are COVID-19. Let, 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 let me stop you right there. Are, are we differentiating between dying from or dying with? Um, I, I think this is basically what people think are, are dying, you know, what they're saying are dying with and from. I mean, I, I think they, there's not a great differentiation there. Um, so for example, you had uh, early on, we had all of those folks dying um, in the nursing homes. That was our, 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 the big Achilles heel in Virginia. The first couple of months was the long-term care facilities, which um, while we were focusing on PPE and hospitals, we hadn't focused enough on what was happening in the long-term care facilities. And I, I think people could make a case in that, that, you know, that there's some mix of dying from and with. Um, but by and large, these are what they think called probable COVID deaths is how they determine it. And where we stand in the nation is that um, in terms of our death rate, Virginia is kind of in the midpoint of the nation there. Um, we're by no means near as high as some of the other states in terms of death rates that, you know, got hit early, the Michigans, the New Yorks, the New Jerseys, and, and the like. Um, and so we're kind of at a midpoint in the nation there. Um, and our case numbers are starting to approximate where we stand in the nation in terms of population, that we're reflecting that. So our, our performance has not been, um, you know, uh, very unusual, you might say, compared to what you might expect, that we've been um, sort of in the midpoint uh, in terms of death rates, and at the same time, we're um, approximately where we are in population in terms of the number of cases. So we haven't been able to figure out if our policies and reactions to this have been any better than anywhere else in the country. We're sort of middling, <clears throat> like Virginia tends to in a lot of these situations, I think. Well, well, maybe uh, here is the one place I, I would say we might be, we might actually be a little better in that when you look at that map, you know, the, um, I think uh, Johns Hopkins has this sort of map of the, of the virus. And what you see is that in the beginning of months, when you take a look at where the epicenter was nationally, Northern Virginia and the DC area, the sort of the Delmarva area there, it, it was really the Southern tip of the East Coast epicenter that um, when you looked at the map, that's where we were in terms of Northern Virginia. So things uh, I think could have been a lot worse in terms of uh, deaths and whatever, but I think I, I would give the governor some credit there for his cautionary uh, position. Um, probably was helpful in um, ensuring that uh, Northern Virginia didn't go the way of uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut in that way, where we could have, uh, given the fact that the, our case numbers were quite high there. Yeah, I'm not trying to, to insinuate in any way that the, the governor or the, com the Commonwealth itself did anything wrong or over, you know, better. I'm just trying to understand how did we do relative to, I guess, peer states. And I guess we have to look at this geographically because, it's frank frankly, we're not Wyoming and, and the Dakotas. You know, we, we were in the, on the East Coast mix there and sort of the late blooms that have happened down in the, in the southern tier states. Uh, we're obviously in the middle of all that. So I, I guess the, the, the questions that come to people's mind are, you know, where are we relative to this, this uptick or spike, if you will? And is it, is it calming down or have we, have we, have we, has, it, has it peaked? 
Well, that's, a, that's a, such a good question because it depends where you are in the state, I think. Uh, and, that, and that's what makes it so interesting. Northern Virginia, um, which is our far and away our most populous part of the state, is looking really pretty good right now. Even, even today, I looked at the numbers. I think there was maybe a 140 cases in the core Northern Virginia communities. It's, you know, it's not knocked out. Um, but the, uh, you know, the numbers are down. So if they can stay down, we'll, we'll be okay. And we'll, we'll miss that spike that we're seeing further south. At the same time, you look at Hampton Roads, you look at some parts of Southwest Virginia. I got, a, I got an email that was very interesting the other day from a healthcare provider um, in Washington County, uh, you know, right outside of Abington and on, you know, near Bristol and on the border there. And, and they told me the numbers there while they're going up are actually much higher because some of the, uh, most of the people in Washington County go to hospitals in Tennessee. They go to Bristol or they go to Johnson City, Tennessee. And the situation there has actually gotten worse. So um, in some places we're getting worse, but in our biggest population area, we're getting much better. And that, and that has enabled us, I think, to avoid the spike that we're seeing in uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and the like. And, and in fact, you know, our population is far, more, far larger than South Carolina, and we probably have half the cases today that they had yesterday. So, Yeah, and talking with folks who live along the beach in, uh, in South Carolina, uh, most of the residents are very upset because of the people who have come into uh, South Carolina beaches for vacation are not from South Carolina. They're bringing it from you know, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states, um, and that's where they're seeing their blooms from. Uh, so they're, the, the residents are kind of ticked off about this. And I guess what has, what has me wondering is, has the Northern Virginia behaviors changed to the point at which they've gotten control of it? And then the rest of the state, which was frankly rural and socially distant anyway, is now going, oh gosh, when it comes here, it's going to spike up. We got to wear masks, be socially distant. So this is this learning curve of the protection of initial social distancing yeah. that has occurred outside the regions. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you that you remark about that be, of South Carolina because um, in the Roanoke area, the stories in the local papers uh, tend to be the reverse. They're saying that what's happened is that people in Southwest Virginia went down to Myrtle Beach um, over the last few weeks, and they've brought it back from South Carolina. Right. Um, and that is the the large the big complaint right now in um, in south in, in, in the Roanoke area and f further southwest is what's happened for people in that area who vacationed in South Carolina and have returned it. Um, and that again is a little different than what we saw previously. What we saw previously, for example, in a lot of the rural areas, was that it hit um, Latino communities very hard who are working in. Um, you know, greenhouses and agricultural plant, uh, meatpacking plants and the like. Um, and now we're seeing this sort of um, element about vacationing. Right. And uh, my presumption is that some people in Virginia Beach would tell you that's part of the reason as well. People coming from elsewhere um, to vacation at the beach. Right. And this is where, because the, look, the, the tourism hospitality industry got smacked hard early on this thing. And when, when, I think when people found out this thing was going down, things were getting better, they're like, oh, it's okay to go on vacation now. And then they realize they got there and they're going, oh my gosh, everyone's coming from everywhere else. And they were sharing this thing rather than staying home and staycationing. Um, that, that's just the, at the behaviors. We saw that. And this is how this thing transmitted in the first place. People left China and they went mm -hmm. to Europe and went to the United States and this thing bloomed all over the world. Well, you know, Chris, um, you're, you're beginning to see this argument a little bit as well in another venue. Um, you know, there's been uh, some discussion in Charlottesville between um, the mayor of Charlottesville and some council people in Charlottesville and UVA because the, uh, some of the elected officials in Charlottesville are saying these UVA students are going to come back in from all over the world uh, and all over America. And uh, what, what might they be bringing to Charlottesville? They're not so happy about uh, all the students coming back and living in, um, living in their town in a month or two. So that's another uh, uh, kind of twist on what might be happening here as well. Well, it would seem to me advisable to do, we have a young man who graduated with our youngest son who just went into the Navy this week and he's going to quarantine for two weeks uh, in a hotel uh, they said, you know, bring three books, and that's it. And so they're quarantining people out of the gate because th you know, they're not stopping their operations either. I wonder if it's going to be logical for some of these students going back to college to go early 
you know, get into their rooms early and basically quarantine so they don't do that. So they're not the super spreaders that we would hope them not to be. No, I mean, that, that's going to be the big challenge for the colleges and universities, almost all of whom, um, even if they're having classes virtually, want most of the students back, uh, back on campus. And so the question there is, uh, you know, can colleges be a relative bubble or are they going to wind up being a Petri dish? Um, and no one quite knows right now, but that is, um, you know, so we, we've seen some schools around the, around the country basically saying, no, we really don't want to um, have people come back. We've seen that with a lot of California schools. Others are going to say, well, we'll bring back half the class um, for one semester, you know, for part of the semester, half the class for the other part of the semester. Um, in Virginia, most of the public universities are hoping to have, um, you know, almost all of the students come back on site. And that is going to be, um, you know, that's going to be their challenge um, going forward if we, if a month from now we haven't done a little better in right. knocking out the virus throughout the rest of the state. Well, it seems like out of an abundance of caution, if they're going to bring kids back on campus, they might want to consider a, a quarantine time so that everyone gets a handle on this thing. Well, my, I'm afraid that, especially because, look, these universities, those who can uh, not have students on campus are going to because they're, they're, they don't have to. They're wealthy enough. They have a big enough endowment. They can withstand it. These other schools that are living off, living off you know, vapors when it comes to their endowment and alumni donations and state support, they have to bring kids back on campus to have that room and board support their overall mission. That's just, it's just financial decision. It's an economic decision. And that yeah, sort of- it's even, to, it, you know, it's even tuition. I think you know, that, that in, in these instances, because um, you know, there's there some students, if it's all online, they'll take a gap year. Um, Absolutely. You know, even if they don't have great employment opportunity right now, they may not, they may not want to come back when they could um, wait a year and come back. And, and that's particularly true, I think, of um, what you might call the, you know, the non-flagships um, there. And so, um, you know, my, my sense is that they're really interested in having the kids on campus. And then, and then secondly, you know, even, even when you think about universities, um, they have some of the same challenges you have in K-12 with a sort of class differentials in terms of acquaintance with and capacity to do online learning uh, in, in that sense. And, you know, I knew I, I just left the VCU board and we had um, um, surveyed students uh, about their, their happiness with online learning over the last couple of months after the school um, basically sent students home. And what we found is that there's a significant portion of students who weren't very comfortable with online learning, that there are, there are a number of students who are really comfortable, who like it, who enjoy it, who um, don't find any, uh, any issues with it. And then there are other students who are less comfortable right now. What's, what, and, percentage, and, what percentage, Bob? What are you looking at? Um, I think you're, lo you're looking at, um, uh, you know, let me just say, it's, it's, it's hard to say for sure what that would be. Um, but, but, this the business, is but the business model for higher education is, a, is about to change because that portion of the students are going to be completely comfortable learning online and not going to a college campus and incurring those other costs going forward. I, I think there's going to be more and more of that as the schools get better, Chris, as well, at doing online uh, education. So that, that's, another, that's the other issue that, that, that's okay. here. Um, my sense is that when you have good online education, you know, particularly for, um, you know, dedicated university students, when you have the curriculum that's set, when you have great, um, you know, sort of, when, when the class is organized well, when all the assignments are organized well, when the faculty member is comfortable with it, all of that, I think, works extremely well in many instances. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you just start it up, and people may not have been, when the faculty member wasn't expecting to do it, when the students were uh, thinking they were having another kind of education, when it, all of a sudden they're thinking about when am I gonna get the hands-on experience with the labs? Um, and if that hasn't been fully thought out and you had to just do it rapidly, you're going to have some level of discomfort. So I think you're right, uh, because more and more, I think students want it both ways. They, they like in, on, uh, on-site instruction, but they also want all the class online as well. I think, remember when we were growing up, you, and you, if you were skipping a class, you would um, 
try to arrange so somebody would have you take notes for you. Remember that? Of course. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And so now you, no one wants to ask somebody to take notes. They want the faculty member to have those notes online. Oh, and, um, and in the yeah. slide like, and ran recorded, you know. Right. That's audio. just ex that's expected now. So the, the expectation is there. And I think you're right that we're going to have more and more uh, higher education and professional development that's going to be online. Uh, the question is, when you just do it right away, and you do it with faculty who weren't expecting it and the like, uh, the quality can suffer a little bit. Well, it's going to suffer a little bit, but this is going to be a, a, a reckoning, in my estimation, for the business model for most higher education institutions, because they can scale. I mean, if I'm, if I'm in, uh, say, Roanoke, and I'm, you know, I don't want to go to VCU, I can take Bob Holdsworth, Holdsworth's class online, and so can anyone in the world. You know, and right. that, that, that becomes an opportunity for a lot of colleges who have the, the talent like a Bob Holdsworth or UVA or Larry Sabato. And that's where the competition really becomes, you know, difficult for some of those who don't have the established names and brands that people really want and are willing to pay for. Because when Harvard said, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna give you a discount for learning online, they can do that because they're Harvard, right? right. <laughs> it's still a Harvard degree on, on the background. So well, this you know, is- you yeah, and, and I can tell you that all the schools that, that are going online now, they're going to deal with student protests about their tuition rates. They should. Uh, it's legitimate. <laughs> students are going to say, why am, I, why am I paying these rates? That's the other issue that's going to occur. It's going to be much more challenging to uh, maintain the rate um, because the students are going to be asking for various kinds of discounts. We've seen it a, uh, a little bit already. I think we're going to see it in a more organized form come this year. Absolutely. And, you know, that's part of the marketplace. Once you go in, once you flatten the reality of this thing, what's the differentiation between, you know, one college to the next when it comes to learning some basic stuff. So these colleges and universities are going to be, you know, they're going to have to redo their entire business model and, and find an area of differentiation that says it's important to get this degree from this university versus going to Purdue online because they have the Kaplan model and they're, and they're blowing it out. Does it really matter to employers? I can tell you flat out, no. No, well, it, it depends which employer and what, what, what and place, what but I think you're right. I think the majority, you know, in many instances, the majority of employers want to know that somebody is re, you know, has some basic knowledge, can read, write, work with other people. Mm -hmm. um, there are some areas where you really need the tech, you know, you're going to have to pa you know, pass a CPA test to, to get an accounting degree. Right. Um, but in many instances, um, where, where there isn't a clear differentiation in terms of the pedigree of the degree, um, one degree can be as good as another. And I, I would tell you now, Chris, I, I would guess that if you looked at master's degrees in teaching right now, I, I would guess that 30 to 50% of these nationally come from online institutions mm -hmm. um, on that front that, um, you know, I could be wrong, but my, you know, my sense is that a lot of the teachers are, um, you know, they have, they have families, they have, sometimes they have young kids. Um, it's not too easy to go to, um, you know, travel 20 miles and, and back and forth at six, in, six in the evening to get a master's degree, but you can work two to three hours on the computer at home after you put the kids to bed. Uh, and be able to do that. So there, there are a number of degree areas where it, it, it's far easier to do this. And then, as you said, there's, there's particular locations that people have where they can't access um, universities very, very easily, uh, particularly if they're thinking about going to school in the evening, if they're working during the day. And online programs are a godsend for these folks. Absolutely. And uh, my daughter, because She's in, a, she's in an American University master's program for counterterrorism and homeland security. She's never foot, stepped foot on campus. And she's taken most of this while her, she's with her husband down at Camp Lejeune, who's he's in the Marine Corps. You know, this is, this is the way of the world going forward. Yeah. And uh, those universities that don't get with the program are going to be left behind in the future. Yeah, I mean, we established a, a master's degree in an online master's degree in homeland security in VCU probably six or eight years ago, uh, particularly for that reason. Um, so you can find ways of, of doing that. And universities who can't, um, you know, uh, access that marketplace are going to have a lot of trouble down, down the road. Let's, let's, let's try to switch back to healthcare because that, that's the, we, we sort of went down that <laughs> rabbit hole 
on uh, on uh, reopening schools in particular. But uh, we get a lot of questions here online, and people are texting, going, "Okay, ask him about X, Y, and Z." But let's let's see if we if we can uh, get on back on healthcare a little bit here. What's the mortality like in Virginia? Are we getting better at diagnosing earlier and stopping people from dying from COVID? Yeah, I think nationally um, that's happening everywhere, actually, Chris. That um, you know, there are a couple of things that are happening. Uh, one, um, as we've done better in just addressing some of the issues in the long-term care facilities, uh, the people who are uh, getting COVID now are a younger cohort, and they are just, in some sense, less likely to die. Um, secondly, there are some better therapeutics, uh, particularly, I think, the um, the steroids that 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 the methadone. Um, that's being used earlier on. That's been helpful. Um, Remdesivir um, seems to be somewhat helpful. And I think people just, uh, you know, the doctors learn pretty quickly. So they've learned uh, in some instances not to use um, ventilators that they can, they can actually keep people alive without them. And then when they use ventilators, they've gotten better at their use. And I think that's still, that's going to continue on uh, in terms of the the therapeutics and, and and ultimately I think the big hope here at least in the short term is that maybe some of this um, <clears throat> uh, plasma therapy or antibody therapy um, might come on board and might actually be very helpful over a few in the next few months um, so I think we're doing far better on, on that front at, at the same time you know, even if people recover from COVID, if they, they've been on a ventilator, they often, they often have some very serious problems long-term that, that goes on. So um, we still need to do better on the therapeutics, I think. But I, I, I'm confident about that because I just think that the medical community, um, you know, having again been um, near them at VCU for, uh, for 30 years, uh, they're just an extraordinarily impressive group and they learn very quickly. And um, my guess is that things are going to get better there um, over the next six months. And then by that time, we're hoping that we find some kind of um, vaccine that can actually uh, work, particularly with the populations that are most vulnerable. And then the, uh, the, the, the plasma antibody regimens that are becoming out, people who have had the uh, who'll be able to donate their their plasma as a as an effective therapy? So that's all. It's all. Everyone's been looking for this this silver bullet and all this. There is no silver bullet when it comes to this stuff. It's because everyone's different. Every person's different. You know, boosting their immune systems. That's going to be a whole shift in our thinking. Diet and exercise. You know, taking vitamin D supplements and the like as a as a way to boost their immune systems is going to become, I think, a, a, an industry into itself. Right, exactly, and I think I think you know, as you said, there's probably unlikely to be a silver bullet for everybody, um, but by and large, I think we'll get better um, at treatments and 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 ultimately um, find find a vaccine, and then we'll have to get better at making sure that people get vaccinated, or encouraging them to uh, make the decision to get vaccinated. But by and large, I think. Um, you know, the, the medical profession learned and they've learned over the last few months and they'll continue to learn and they'll continue to invent things um, or create, create treatments that, that will get us better. Um, but right now, it's still pretty daunting if you wind up in an ICU. Um, so on, on the, on the, with respect to the ventilator, you know, the post-ventilator reality for a lot of patients, especially elderly patients who, who've recovered from COVID but still have you know, potential damage in their heart and lungs, what, what are the next steps are you seeing? Are you seeing any in the data that says, you know, these people are having problems uh, after that? Yeah, well, I think what you're seeing is that they have, there's a number of kind of problems that s seem to um, continue to exist for certain people, uh, not for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Some clearly have um, problems with, um, you know, even if they haven't had asthma, they have uh, lung damage that seems to be relatively um, long, long standing. We don't know whether it's permanent or not. Uh, there are some people having issues with, uh, with cognition. Um, you know, at, at worst, it's sometimes hallucination, but at other times it's memory lapses and the like, um, because I think some blood clots have found their way um, up toward the brain. Um, and so, they're, they're continuing, you know, other people have problems with fatigue. It's almost as if they have chronic fatigue symptoms uh, as well. So um, you have this combination of the people who are 
who have died, and then you have the you know sort of the living wounded um, uh, there as well. So that that's another complication of this disease uh, that that seems to make it really different from a normal flu. Well, let's let's talk about that. When we talk about the flu, is this is this going to help us get better equipped societally to deal with the, the seasonal flu? Because a lot of people die of the seasonal flu, and it's just sort of like, we don't really mention it because it's the flu and we're sort of used to it. Um, but are we going to be able to get earlier detection on flu symptoms to get treatments earlier to prevent this kind of death? Well, the, um, you know, the, you know we, we basically have a shot for the flu if you would take it. Uh, yeah, but, which would no, people don't. <laughs> yeah, but that 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 that's probably the big challenge. There is really uh, just sort of uh, getting more people, a larger percentage of people, to get the flu shots and to believe that they work. Which I think they they probably work to uh, certainly limit the um, extent of the disease in most cases. And we're gonna we're, we're gonna have an exper you know a, a living experiment of that this fall, um, because one of the things that the CDC um, director has uh, warned about is a combination of uh, a resurgence of COVID and uh, happening at the same time that flu season occurs. So we'll begin to see whether or not more and more people, um, you know, a higher percentage of people get the flu shot this fall, given the concern that uh, about this sort of dual threat that could emerge. I, I might just say anecdotally, I got a call from um, the Wegmans Pharmacy the other day asking me if I wanted to reserve my flu shot this year, um, okay. you know, which, I, which I did. Uh, <laughs> I would imagine these days. Really. You know, and they, they told me they, they'll, they'll call me when they have it ready. Um, so clearly there are some people and some pharmacies that are preparing, uh, preparing for this and are expecting um, to have a larger demand for, uh, for, for flu shots this season. I might also add that um, the uh, accounting for a flu death is very different than the accounting for a COVID death. Um, that the flu death typically have some, at the end of the year, they make an estimate. They, they take the number of people who have been diagnosed and have clearly died with the flu, and then they, then they put a multiplier in there. It's like almost like an economic impact statement. They say, then the multiplier, this is, this is the number of people who must have died from the flu. Um, well, the that's, that's did, asinine. I mean, we, well, we, have the, we have the technology to say, you, you could, there should be an app that says, yep, he died of the flu, click the button, and they total it up. This is not difficult in the 21st century. Well, but that's, uh, if you take a look at how, 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 the, how flu deaths are measured, and how COVID deaths are measured. Because I looked at this, because there was, there was all, all kinds of folks saying, well, you know, you, there's many people die from the flu, who die from COVID. And then I basically began to look at what the methods were for determining who died from the flu. And um, there's a pretty significant multiplier um, that is attached to the actual number of people who were diagnosed and um, clearly were, uh, you know, died in the hospital from a flu. Uh, whereas COVID, the COVID deaths are far more, um, you know, noted as probable and suspected COVID deaths, and there's not a multiplier that's attached to the end of it. So that's what will happen at the end of this, at, at the end of the pandemic. There will be people who will come along and say, these are the number of people who probably died. Now, he, he, you, you may have seen the other day, uh, to complicate the matter a little further, there's this... Um, extraordinary doctor at VCU, Steve Wolf, um, who may be the nation's uh, leader in looking at, um, you know, sort of mortality rates and death rates. And, and in particular, what he has done over the last five or six years prior to COVID is that he looked, he's, he's looked at uh, death rates by zip codes to really show sort of what, what, what turns to be this tremendous economic class divide in the United States by um, where you die. If you live in Southwest Virginia, your mortality rate is far higher. Just in general, you die at a lower age than if you live in Fairfax County um, and the like. And so now he, uh, over the last, uh, this week, he published a piece, I think in the Journal of the American Medical Association, looking at excess deaths with respect to COVID. And so what he found is that there's been a significant number of what he calls 
excess deaths over what you have seen per year, some of which may be associated with COVID and others which may be associated with people not going to the hospital for treatment of various kinds of um, chronic diseases that they already had. Um, so we've seen this you know, other complication that's now arisen that we have deaths from COVID and then we have deaths from people who um, may not have gone in for the kind of treatment they should have gone um, because of um, you know, their reasoning about what was happening with COVID. Well, we're gonna to have to really dive into those numbers because there's, and unfortunately, as you know, as a political scientist, we're, we're in a very political season and everyone wants to point fingers and win an election. That's just what happens. Um, and my, my concern is we're not getting to the heart of the matter and actually solving the problem because everyone's so pent up on this, uh, on this, on this election season. And I, and oh, I think, I think that, that's, that's right. Yeah. Everything's become political, though, in, in some ways, a little less political. I mean, the, um, you know, for, look, for a month or two, mask wearing seemed to be very, very political. Um, but we saw some surveys yesterday that now basically show, uh, you know, 75% of Americans say they wear them most of, all the time when they go out to a store, and 14% say they wear them most of the time. So that's become a little less political. Now it's been, you know, it's down to about 10 or 12% of people who are, um, you know, making a statement where most, most people have now begun to wear them. And you've even seen businesses change a little bit. Um, you know, for the first couple of months of the pandemic, if you went into a store, they basically told you you had to wear a mask because of order of the governor or order of a politi uh, elected official. And now a number of stores are putting, putting their own statement out. We don't want, you know, we want you to wear the mask. Right. Um, right. So I think that's become a little less political and that's probably a good thing. Well, it's definitely become more culturalized as this has spread. I know here in Henrico County, right down the street where we had one of the nursing homes that got smacked pretty hard. I was, you know, I was staying away from the local grocery store that was closest to that because I didn't, you know, it was, it was a matter of proximity, right? It's like the closer you got to it, the more likely you, you were probably going to get to it. But the masks I also saw was somewhat economic uh, in the, in the with respect to, you know, less affluent people being able to have access to masks on a regular basis. They weren't re necessarily readily available especially in rural areas where they're socially distant anyway. So there was a, a supply chain problem there too. Is, is that something that data is showing as well? That, that it was also economic in, in reality for some people? Well, I think, I, yeah, I think it, would, it may have to do with where you were, right? as you said. I think if you were in a place that was a hotspot, um, not wearing one was probably more of a political statement. Um, you know, if you're in a place that had, um, you know, five cases, you know, in a county of 20,000 people, uh, you were probably thinking, you know, this hadn't come, this really hadn't been here, and this really hadn't hadn't come here. There's no reason to do it per se um, right. on that front. Um, you know, Henrico County, I might mention, is is a county that actually, um, you know, had a uh, fairly uh, strong leap forward very early in terms of the numbers because of the um, mm -hmm. the long-term care facilities that were that recently their numbers have been down very considerably. They um, most days they have between 20 and 40 cases. Yeah, I've, I've seen just a local anecdote. I know anecdote is not a, is not, is not, is not data, but the local food line here, when I used to go in there, when this first broke out, there might be 10% of the people wearing the mask. And I might, it might be 5% now that don't wear the mask. Yeah. I mean, that it, it, I, I think the, the targets and the, um, uh, you know, the grocery stores now are probably at 90% as far as I can see. I think it's the unusual person now, um, you know, who's not wearing a mask in those situations. So I think that that's changed pretty dramatically in Virginia and probably in most of the hotspots around the country. Is that the number one thing that people can do to stop the spread is just not wear a mask? It was wear a mask rather. <laughs> well, I think that and socially distance and, um, you know, I, I think we just keep learning or they keep learning as you go along. You know, at first they didn't think the masks were very effective. Now they think they're extremely effective. Um, beyond that, I think the, um, you know, I think most people, I think the evidence seems to suggest that outside transmission is far more difficult than inside transmission. Um, and what we've seen, I think, is that um, 
you know, uh, when the bars reopened and young people went into the bars, that, that became a real problem in a number of areas. Um, I don't know exactly what's happening in, you know, the, the Myrtle beaches and whatever, whether that's outside transmission or inside transmission that we've seen. Um, but by and large, I mean, the, the question is, you know, and then how do you organize to work safely, which is really the, you know, another key issue for the economy. Um, you know, and what we've seen is that I think a number of workplaces have changed their rules um, and we, and they seem to be doing pretty well. Um, we've had a lot of trouble with the places that have really had the close quarter um, working facilities, uh, the meat packing plants up in, um, you know, on the Eastern shore, the meat packing plants up in the Northern Valley um, have had issues because they, those issues are twofold. One has been the, um, the close quarters of the workers while they work. And then secondly, a number of these workers were living in close quarters and oftentimes multi-generational uh, families and multi-generational activities. And we don't have, you know, we, we really didn't have any way of isolating and quarantining them. Um, and so I think uh, you had this debate going on between some people saying it's, you know, this is happening at the business. And then you had other people saying, well, it's not really happening at the business. It's happening at the home uh, where people are transmitting it. Um, I, I, I found that to be like a kind of fruitless debate because what you'd want to do is improve both situations. Right, uh, right. You'd want to make sure that uh, you, you find a way to, um, you know, ensure that the business is safer. And at the same time, you needed better community public health activities that could uh, communicate and um, provide the opportunities for isolation and tracing simultaneously. Have you seen any correlation, Dr. Bob Holsworth, with the increase in testing and the increase of diagnosis? Is it, is it relative at all? I mean, we've, we've seen yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Of in, in some ways it is, and in some ways it isn't. Okay, so... Um, you know, and that's where the test positivity rate, I think, becomes a big, uh, a big indicator, as well as the hospitalization rate. So, for example, if you're getting more cases, but the, the test positivity rate is also going down, that would tell you that, it, and the hospitalizations were going down, that would tell you that uh, I, I think that, you know, it, the, the, the extent of testing is 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 contributing to the having a larger number of confirmed cases. If, however, um, the test positivity rate is going up and the hospitalization rate is going up at the same time, uh, you'd be less likely to say it's simply the testing that's leading to the confirmed cases. So, um, for example, when you think about what what's happened in Florida and Arizona recently. Um, you know, if your ICU beds are getting uh, overextended, it's hard to say that the, um, the, the reason for the confirmed right. cases right. are simply the, uh, the testing because you've got more people in hospitals, too. Right. Well, that's, I mean, that's more, I'm thinking more towards Virginia, I mean, especially in Hampton Roads that had the most recent uptick. Yeah. And because, we're, because we're trying to get, I mean, I guess what, it's the incomplete data set that has got, I think people worked up about, you know, what they can and can't do and they want some assurance. And, and look, yeah. this is all new to us. We've never done this pandemic. Well, it's been a hundred years, right? Yeah. yeah there's, there's a fog of war type of issues that come up in this, right? Um, you know, we're dealing with it for the first time. Uh, people make mistakes. Um, you know, VDH has made mistakes. State governments made mistakes. Um, some of the long-term care facilities made mistakes. Everybody in this situation um, in trying to do the best thing sometimes uh, makes mistakes. So what's happened in Virginia of late is that, um, you know, it's hard to say that it's simply, uh, you know, more testing. If Campton Roads communities went from 40 cases to 400 cases, that's probably uh, not more testing, while at the same time, Northern Virginia went down, went from 700 cases to 125 cases while they were getting more testing as well. Right, so, right. so it's hard to say that that is that. that right. it's simply, and that's the data point we have to show out to people, right? It's like, look, it's not just because we're testing more. It's because we're the behaviors are not consistent with what we need to do to get bring the caseload down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we were testing more, we'd have the you know, if it was simply the result of the testing, we'd be getting the same results everywhere. 
Um, and, and, you know, and the other, the other issue on that, uh, I think that why it's not simply the, um, not simply the testing, but we are, we are doing more, is that of late, um, we've seen our test positivity rate inch up. Now, um, thankfully, what it had done for a couple of, for a, for a month previously, it had, we had a rapid decline from like test positivity rates of 15 and 16% down to 5.8%. Today, it's at 7.2%. Um, that's not horrible. Um, but we've seen in the past 10 days, a little bit of this uptick. And that's because of the, um, uh, you know, I, I think that not just the testing, but the, the positivity rate is going up as well. And that tells you that the virus is still out there. Um, you know, in New York right now, they're getting test positivity rates around 1%. Um, there that it shows you they've really kicked it out, uh, at least for the, you know, for the time being. It looked like we were getting to that rate. We, you know, we were getting down to 5.6%, 5.8%. It looked like we were, you know, every day we were declining in the seven-day rolling average. And for the past 10 days, it's inched back up, okay? It, ha it hasn't, um, you know, it hasn't spiked back up. It's, you know, not at 10%, it's not at 12%, um, but it's sort of, been moving in the wrong direction a little bit and that's because of these other places outside of northern virginia where the virus has now uh, migrated to is there any way to correlate the movement of people to those positivity rates because in new york city there's estimated a half a million people have left uh the city of new york I mean, they fled after this broke out right and um i wonder if the movement towards hampton roads for beachgoers and even the day trippers going from chesapeake suffolk that you mentioned before is there any way to show that in the data just yet no i, I haven't been able to find any way of doing that i think you know by and large we we thought you know we we certainly thought when we went to phase two and then to uh, phase three uh that cases would go up somewhat um and that's largely because there just seems to be a correlation when you have more people interacting more frequently right. um, over a wider array of distance, you're likely to have more cases. So the question then becomes, what's acceptable in terms of the cases and the hospitalization and the death? Where, where, at what point do you say this is sort of the um, natural result of uh, opening up and it's, and it's at an acceptable range. And at what point do we have to make some adjustments? So what the governor did was said, well, let's make an adjustment about bars or let's make an adjustment about alcohol sales and what time they can go on. Mm -hmm. um, let's make an adjustment about, uh, you know, and, and see if that can have that impact. So. That, that, that's kind of the question that all these decision makers and policy makers have to deal with. Uh, when do you say, okay, now it's gotten out of hand, we gotta dial it back a lot. And when do you say we can continue to make these modest adjustments and try to do these improvements in uh, workplace safety or community safety or communication with the communities right. that will enable us to go forward. And then this issue again, Chris, that I'll, I'll come back to is that in a month, you know, we're thinking not only about colleges and universities, but about K-12 schools. And this is, this is really going to be important because in, in some ways, you know, if we don't have these schools open, kids, particularly kids who come out of challenging uh, circumstances, they really, really suffer. Um, but at the same time, we're getting increased anxiety among parents and teachers and, and school staff um, about this. And, and this is going to be a real issue for Virginia um, that's coming up in the next few weeks about how do we deal uh, with K-12 school reopening. And, and this is where we find, you know, as, as we mentioned, uh, we think that, you know, certain degree of online education is a wave of the future in higher education. What do we say about K-12, particularly for those communities that don't have good broadband access, right. that don't have uh, students who have uh, experience with that, you know, and, and, and that's in some of the rural communities and some of the urban communities. And that's the issue that we're really facing right away here. And that absolutely on the on the K through 12, especially given the fact that most teachers aren't equipped and haven't been trained to, you know, take it full advantage of the virtual education. But I think one of the questions that 
people in the political context, and I, I know Dr. Bob Holdsworth, you, you get this because of your political science background. So you have all these protests out there, young people in particular going to these protests. Have there been any blooms as a result of this, any spreading? Because if you look at that younger demographic who were at these protests for the most part, it makes it difficult to say, no, we shouldn't go to college or school because the young people can congregate and safely and uh, do what they did in the protests. And I mean, so where's where the answer there? I mean, there, that's, I think that's a- yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the answer, of, um, I mean, okay, here, here's, here's the question as I see it there. Um, you know, at the moment, let us say, I think the, probably the largest protests have been in RVA. Uh, in Virginia. They were large. And um, the Richmond area hadn't seen a discernible, at least right now, a, a discernible rise. Um, it had, you know, uh, we're getting somewhere around 80 to 120 cases a day in what I call the RVA communities. And they, that extends from Hanover to Prince George. Um, and I, I've seen, as I said, Henrico is getting about 20 cases a day. Richmond somewhere between 20 and 30. Chesterfield usually a little more, actually. Um, but um, I haven't, at least right now, haven't been able to see that rise. So the question is, um, is that because we don't have a lot of community spread, or is that because most of these protests were outside? <laughs> Right. Is it different when you have a party in a fraternity house uh, than when you have a protest at, um, at the monuments? Well, I mean, schools can say, you know, no, no parties and fraternities. They can, they can clamp down that stuff just as, just as easily as the governor can. The governor can probably do it, too, if we're still under a state of emergency. I think is, it's tougher at a school. <laughs> well, absolutely, especially a college school when, when kids are going to be socializing and uh, look, this this not, <laughs> good judgment doesn't go at uh, hand in hand with young young college kids. Yeah, I mean, a, a university is built on social networking, not social distancing. Right. <laughs> exactly, and social connectivity, and all the and all the all the attending problems that come with that. Dr. Bob Holsworth, thanks for joining us here in Virginia Free TV. We really appreciate your time. Hope to have you back in the future to get an update. But I really want to drill down these numbers in the future. And I can't thank you enough for your time this morning. Great to be with you, Chris. You have a good day. You too. Thanks, Bob.